Welcome to New Endings Radio. My name is Darren. I'm your host today, and we have our co-host Stacy with us. Hello. Stacy, we're going to be talking to Anna from Indiana. Yes, we are. She's going to be talking about uh, her childhood sexual abuse issues right. that she had. Right, yep. And this is the type of story that happens quite a lot. And right. you, you don't hear a whole lot about it because people bottle it up inside, don't right. talk about it. And then they struggle with alcohol, drugs, what right, have you, whatever exactly. they turn to. Yeah. Well, she's going to tell us how her situation kind of guided her life and absolutely in, in yeah. different directions mm-hmm. that you know, probably wouldn't normally have happened. But you know, yeah. she started you making some know. bad choices. Right. So in any case, uh, she's going to come on and tell us about that and how Celebrate Recovery helped her recover. Yes. She is a firm believer in Celebrate Recovery like we are. Yeah. With Celebrate Recovery, Jesus Christ is our only true higher power. Yes. So that's what makes it work. Amen. So let's go ahead and get Anna on here. Anna, welcome to New Innings Radio. Hi, Anna. Hello. Hey, Anna, I don't know how many of these shows you've listened to, but the main thing with New Endings Radio is that we try to relate to other people that are out there. And uh, we talk to a lot of people, and there's a lot of times where there's something in their life that just made them want to make a change. And right. I, I call it flipping here. Uh-huh. You know, everyone's bottom is different. You, you don't have to be living on a gutter or homeless to, right. be, to hit bottom. You know, everybody's bottom is different. In my case, you know, I was still happily married. Had a job, had a house, didn't lose anything. You know, it was just, I just got tired. It was just mentally exhausting, basically. Yeah, right. So everybody's bottom's different. So was there a point in your life, Anna, where you just decided, look, I, I whatever I'm doing, I got to make a change because this ain't working. Yeah. So, you know, it was quite a few years ago and, you know, through a, a series of really poor life choices um, th- that I had uh, made in my, in my adult years, I uh, found myself divorced and just spiraling. And so finding my worth and my value and, you know, just a series of relationships with men that were empty. And Mm. it just led me down a a really, really dark path. You know, it was just one in particular, it was a December. And I remember on Christmas and I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Wow. I knew at that point that I had to turn back to God. And so, you know, started attending Celebrate Recovery and Mm. kind of never looked back. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, Let's find out what led you to that moment of truth to where you, uh, you know, had to decide to, to do something different. Uh, let's go back to your childhood and let's find out kind of how you grew up. Did you grow up in a Christian home? I did. I, um, actually, my I, I joke because both of my parents were very devout Catholics. I mean, we grew up in a very mm. um, devout Christian household, church on Sundays, catechism on Wednesdays. The, the ironic thing, though, is that, you know, although it was very religious, there was little spirituality, if that makes sense. So we didn't didn't read the Bible. We didn't talk about the Bible. You know, really for me, the catechism was a a social hour with my friends. So I didn't, I knew there was a God, but it was a, I was fearful of him. In my mind, it was a God that if you did things bad, bad things would happen because he would make bad things happen to you. Mm -hmm. So that's really how I grew up. I was a practicing Catholic until, until my divorce. Well, did your parents uh, get along okay? Was there any abuse going on or anything like that? In all outward appearances, you know, we would we appeared like a, a very normal household. My parents okay. got along. My my mom was a uh, she grew up as the oldest of sixteen kids. Wow, so wow. she was <laughs> came from a very very Somebody large was busy. family. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Yes, and, wow. And my dad was from a very small family. So it was an interesting, interesting dynamic. She pretty much wore the pants in the family. That okay. was for sure. And she was, you know, like I said, by all outward appearances, we, you know, we were a normal family, but, but there was some underlying abuse that was going on um, that no one knew about. Okay. Uh, and Involving so you? Or? And, yeah. So oh, it was, see. it was me, uh, my, my brother, who was a year older than I was, uh, started sexually abusing me when I was probably, I'm guessing around sixth grade, you know, it's difficult when you have a traumatic Right. Event that happens in your life, space and time gets a bit fuzzy. So mm. I, I'm guessing it was around that sixth grade time frame until I was probably a sophomore in high school. You know, for most kids, particularly girls, that's a real pivotal time in your oh, life. Yeah. You're trying mm. to, you know, figure out who you are, mm-hmm. you're trying to fit in. So it, it really caused a lot of um, psychological damage, as you can imagine. I was sure. wearing masks. I was you know, oh, yeah. not authentic. I didn't know how to be authentic. Mm-hmm. I was always fearful and you can't get away from it. When it's in your home, you go home to that. And so there was just a lot of inauthenticity, I guess, in okay. my life at that time. Did, and so was right. there, did your parents know, was there any indication that they were aware of what was going on? You know, they, if they did know, they didn't. I mean, 
they didn't say or do anything about it. It wasn't until years later in my 20s when I started getting counseling and therapy for working through this that I shared it with them. Uh-huh. You know, it was one of those things where they just kind of looked at me a little bit perplexed and just said, wow, you know, I'm sorry that happened. It was mm. not, I don't know what I was expecting as far as a response, but I was thinking it was going to be something more than that. I thought they were yeah. going to be you know, outraged and just shocked and, and nothing happened. Go back to, to where we started out and you, I, you said your brother was sexually abusing you. How did this whole thing come about? You know, at the time I, I was, it probably, I was very, very confused as why me? I mean, I had other sisters and I, to my knowledge, didn't happen to them. And I don't believe it has. I may have spoken with them since. But as I've grown up and, and, and into adulthood and have spoke to my other sisters, I found out probably about five or six years ago that my father had, had actually sexually, sexually abused my half-sister who was living with us. Oh. And my, you know, I, I really, really believe that my brother saw that. Mm. Um, and saw that behavior and next to me, I don't know if he walked in on it or, it, you know, or was a part of it. I don't know, but you know, I think kids model and they, and they mimic what they see. In fact, when I made my amends with my brother, you know, he, he actually said the words, I was only doing what I saw. Wow. So, How about that? so I think he justified I, it in his uh, mind. Yeah. So I really think that was a, a big part of it. Well, so you said it went on uh, all the way to you were a sophomore in high school. So how was your grade school and, and uh, middle school? Were you distracted by that? Did it affect you in any way? Relationships at, at school or how did that affect you? You know, it's it's interesting. If you, um, I look back at my, at my middle school and, and high school years and I was really kind of an overachiever. I hung out with the popular kids at school. I was an athlete. My grades were so-so, but I don't know that it was necessarily due to that. I just didn't always love to study. But um, one of the things that I do recall is not having in any type of sense of belonging. Mm-hmm. You know, I just felt like I had to be whoever anyone wanted me to be to fit in. Couldn't be myself. I really remember that. And, re- and, and that's something that stands out to me. Yeah, You kind of you you, morph into what you need to be to fit in. Right. You mm-hmm. wear masks. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now, personally, how was your self-worth? I mean, how did you feel about yourself? You know, this is going on. You, I'm assuming you, you would know that it's not right and you didn't like it or you would have told someone. So you were Absolutely. bearing it because you knew that uh, you didn't, you were embarrassed and probably and didn't want people to know about it. So Absolutely. I, yeah. How did, how did that make you feel personally about yourself? Well, I mean, I can tell you that my self-worth was pretty much non-existent. So right. it's an interesting, as I work with other or been spoken with women who have been abused, one of the things that I turned to, um, ironically, was, you know, sexual relations with other people. Mm-hmm. And so I would have, I was incredibly promiscuous because I was looking for that validation and that sense of love and belonging and worth in other men and boys. Uh, you know, you know, I, I had equated at that time sex as love. Right. So if they wouldn't have sex with me, apparently, they, they mean, they have to love me, right? Mm-hmm. And didn't realize the, the damage that was doing. Right. And that pattern continued, you know, through my middle school and in high school. All right. So you uh, made it through high school, I guess, and uh, went on to do other things. So why don't you tell us, you know, you get out of high school and did you go to college or what happened after that? Well, can I, can I oh, back up just a sure. hair? Go ahead. Anna, what made the abuse stop when you, you know, got to be a sophomore? I couldn't tell you. I don't know. How, I don't know why it stopped. I just okay. know that it did. And it was like very abrupt. Okay. Um, so I can't, I don't, I don't know, you know, I can't put my finger on it. I just know it stopped and life kind of went on as, as usual. I okay. Mean, as, okay. As odd as that sounds. Now I will tell you, you know, Darren, to get back to your point, I got pregnant my junior year in high school. Oh. So one of the, the, the guys that I was dating, he was abusive. He was an abusive alcoholic and, and mm. he and I had a relationship and it was pretty volatile. Um, we ended up getting pregnant my junior year and he was probably three years older than I was we opted to have the baby. So I was pregnant my entire senior year of high school. There, there came a point in my life where I had to make a decision whether or not I was going to stay with this person and, and you know, just live in the little town that I grew up in, or I wanted bigger things. I had, I had big plans. I right. wanted to go to college. I wanted to have a career. And I'm trying to figure out how a baby and a husband fit into this equation. It must yeah. have been pretty uncomfortable. You were going to a public school, I guess. Yes, in a very small town. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. you can imagine the rumor mills. It was a very uncomfortable and unpleasant time. 
Yeah. You know, so. girls, girls were, ta- you know, whispering behind your back and yeah. calling you names and shredded my, what little self-worth I had at that time. But mm-hmm. I pretended like I was okay because I was good at that. I was good at right. stuffing and pretending and, and acting like everything was good. And then yeah. her father and I ended up getting married right after I graduated from high school and the abuse continued and we weren't married long. We ended up getting divorced about six months later. Okay. So you say abuse, physical abuse? It was, yes, it was, a, it was physical abuse. So he had um, an alcohol yeah. issue and, uh, he, and he was taking it out on you basically. And, mm-hmm. and okay. me being the codependent that I was, I thought I could fix him. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I can make it better. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I was here to fix him. I could, I could get him to stop drinking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, well, so how many times have we heard that story, that Stacey, could, about well, uh, people thinking they, they can... Well, not only them. have we heard it, I've lived it. Yeah, so, well, that's true. Yeah, you, can, you have a personal yeah, investment I, in that I one. I sure do, unfortunately. Uh, now, was he was he working at the time, or was he, uh, because of the alcohol, was he not able to hold down a job, and that's why he took things out on you? What was going on in that whole situation? Well, he, he actually was working, and you know, as I mentioned, he was three years older than I was, so he would be what would be we would consider a functioning alcoholic. So he was able to hold a steady job. He had, he made good money, um, mm. but it was a very controlling situation. So we were married. We were living in an apartment. I wasn't allowed to go out, see anyone. I had to keep the blinds closed all day. Wow. I, so we had this tiny apartment, and I'm cleaning this apartment because I had nothing else to do, but he would come home and didn't like the way it was clean, so he'd clean it all again, and then that would a, a fight would ensue, and it yep. was just it was just kind of a very very bad situation. And I remember watching a TV show one day, and the person on the television, it was a, a talk show host, and said, "You have the right to change your mind," and that mm-hmm. just profoundly. And I'm thinking, she's right. I don't have to stay in this marriage. Uh, I can get out, and I can do better things. And you know, my parents were not abusive toward each other, so I I knew that this is not a normal relationship. Right. And, and so I, I was, I, I did, I got out, I wanted better for my daughter and, um, Good. and left and then started, uh, enrolled in a community college and, um, started going, taking classes and living at home. Well, that's, and, that's a big, big step for you because we talk to a lot of women that they can't make that decision. Right. And they stay in it for right. years, you know, because they're afraid that they can't live on their own. Uh, what are they going to do? They have a child and they're not going to make it. I need this person. Right. To, right. Or for your codependency, you just need someone, you know, just so you have someone coming home every day and they just can't get out of that uh, cycle. So that was a big step doing mm-hmm. something like that. Yep. What did, What were you going to college for? Did you have a goal in mind? or? Well, I, at the time I was looking to go and, and become an administrative assistant. And, you know, I, my, I had family that lived in Chicago and I thought, you know, I'm getting, I'd become administrative assistant. I'd move to Chicago with my daughter. We'd have this fantastic life. You know, <laughs> this had been the big city and I had yeah. all these, these yeah. dreams. Right. Unfortunately, the codependency doesn't leave you unless you deal with that. So That's exactly right. as I'm going to school and I'm working part time, I met another guy. We started dating and we ended up getting pregnant about six months into the relationship. So we got married and I'm thinking this is my Prince Charming. I mean, he loved my daughter. He had a daughter the same age and and we were going to have this baby together. He had a great job. I thought this is it. This is great. I've got my life mapped out. I found somebody that's going to love me and my daughter and and he's going to take care of us. But we had a what I would consider a pretty superficial relationship. We really weren't getting into the, the heart of the matter. I didn't share with him about my abuse. I carried that with me like this silent baggage. And that didn't mm. come to a head and come out until we had been married, you know, several years. I was struggling with some depression and anger. Right. And, you know, couldn't put my finger on why I was so angry all the time and just I didn't look forward to things. And so I started going to counseling and then the abuse kind of reared its ugly head as we started walking through things. And then as I was talking through that, he encouraged me to go to my parents and share with them, which I did. Even though I started talking with the therapist about this, it was, again, shared with her what happened, but we didn't deal with it, right? We didn't talk about it and get into the why and, and how it made me really feel. And so I was being very superficial with this counselor. I didn't want to be authentic and I didn't want to share any deep, deep stuff with her. I didn't know how to really dig deep and ask for forgiveness. I felt, I still felt very ashamed, very, very dirty, like tainted goods, like damaged goods. Um, That, that perception in my mind of myself never changed despite the fact that I was sharing, you know, with, about the abuse. So things continued to, to stay, I guess, in my, in my heart and in my mind status quo, I'm still codependent. I'm Mm -hmm. still 
you know, seeking validation from people and things and work. So that, that never, that really never changed. So you were saying that you were were married for a few years. Um, I'm assuming you're not anymore with this gentleman. So what happened with that? How did that all come to pass there? As I was mentioning, the the codependency had had still had had a really strong grip on me and that Mm -hmm. need for validation and acceptance from others. So I started working outside the home and um, which was going great. I was getting accolades at work. And unfortunately, because of that need for that validation and affirmation from others, I ended up meeting um, a gentleman at work and we started having an affair, uh, which was quickly discovered by his wife and my husband. Mm. Um, My husband filed for divorce pretty immediately. It was a really ugly time. My daughters wanted nothing to do with me. They ended up moving in with their dad and it was just an ugly time. And I Things didn't get better after the divorce. I ended up spiraling, um, still trying to find my validation and affirmation in other men, right. but feeling worse than I had ever felt before about myself. Right. Well, what do you suppose made you um, get involved with someone else? Was it the fact that you weren't getting love at home or it was just different? I mean, what was the purpose there? I think it was a combination of things, Darren. It really, you know, I my husband at the time had, um, had issues that I know now, you know, from his childhood were causing some painful things in his life. So he was drinking heavily. There really wasn't a lot of authentic conversation with, you know, between us. We weren't really learning about each other and really deep digging deep to find out about each other. And we weren't living in the word. We weren't. We were going to church for appearances sake, but we, we were not living in the word and we weren't turning to God to help us with our problems. And so it was part of, partly that I wasn't getting that at home, but really I think the bigger piece there was that I just felt so bad about myself and it was easier to find somebody that claimed to love and accept me for who I was and show me that attention and affection and tell me that I was great and beautiful mm-hmm. and wonderful. And you get addicted to that. Right. You, you get addicted to the, the newness so you're in a bad position at this point because your kids won't see you and you're having to, you're out on your own now, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been divorced. I was a, had my own place, but, uh, just felt very alone. You continued to, you stayed in the city or did you make a change after that? Or did you just continue on? What, what was going uh, on? Then? No, I stayed, I stayed in the city and trying to find my worth and dating other men, um, still, inc- still continuing the affair. So that was weighing on me heavily. I'm thinking this person was going to leave their wife um, oh, so yeah. we could get married, right? That was my mm-hmm. pie in the sky vision. And I thank God every day that that didn't happen. Right. Because what a disaster. But at the time, I'm thinking, okay, my husband divorced me. Are you going to divorce your wife so we can get married and live happily ever after? And that never happened. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to go out with these other men, almost like a passive aggressive behavior toward this this gentleman. Like, so, well, if you're not going to marry me, then I've got guys over here who love me, right? It didn't turn out that way. So from there, it just, as I mentioned, I'm continuing to date multiple men. It was a very just a really low, t- low, low, low time in my life, because not only was I not happy with what I was doing, you know, a lot of these men um, were hoping, I mean, they were good guys, and they wanted to have a relationship. And I would string them along for so long, and then I would go back to the affair. And so I did a lot of damage to a lot of people hurt a lot of mm. a lot of people still lying to my girls and telling them, you know, that the affairs ended, but they would catch me in lies. And so it was just this horrible spiral. Um, Wasn't going to church, wasn't, you know, having any type of a relationship with God. Anna, can I, can I ask how old the, your daughters were at this point? Oh yeah. So that was, you know, they were at a very, uh, the two oldest ones were in college. uh, And then I had two that were in um, high school. One was just beginning high school. So they really, really struggled through this time. I mean, right. we ha- I had, there's still some long-term damage and it's a struggle, right. um, you know, because of that, but they just really had a tough time. They, one of them turned to, you know, Adderall and cutting. Mm. Um, and the other one just, you know, went the opposite direction where they became you know, a super overachiever. Right. But I see, I look back now and I see things that they, that they did to cope with this, mm-hmm. you know, with this mom who was absent or living a lie and in what I was showing them through my actions, and even though my words were saying a different thing. Right. Right. And so we go forward and, and it was 
you know, it kind of came to a culmination. Um, you know, I'm seeing this this one gentleman, and I remember it was a Christmas day. I was over there, and I remember thinking to myself, what am I doing? Why am I with this person? I don't care about them. I don't care for them. My life is a mess. I don't have my kids. It's Christmas Day, and I don't have my kids. Right. And I just remember having this epiphany, thinking I need to get some help, and I need to turn my life back over to God because I, I'm at my pit. I'm at, I'm in a pit. I'm at the bottom. I, I'm I have nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. Having the relationships was not doing any good. It was just doing more damage. It was just. It was only making me feel worse and, right. and driving my kids further away. Mm, exactly. True. Yeah. So you at, you said at this point that you decided that you needed to make a change. What did you do exactly to make a change? So I started going back to church. My girls talked me into going oh, to go. a church that they their friends knew about, and we, I started going to church with them. Nice. And I heard about a program there called Celebrate Recovery. And at first, I was a little hesitant because I thought it was for folks with with and, addiction, right? Uh, Things like that. Yeah, addiction yeah, yeah, issues. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, well, you know what? I'll try it and see how it goes. I think the first six months, I think I, I was kind of going through the motions, but we have a saying that says, bring your body and your mind will follow. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question because uh, Celebrate Recovery, you know, is a, a Christ-based program, obviously. And it has a lot yes. to do with relationships with God. But you said you grew up Catholic. Um, yes. This is a kind of a different environment than right. the Catholic environment. Um, For sure. Did did you accept Christ at some point along there, or did you understand what uh, what they were talking about, or what happened with that? Absolutely. So it was an act, it was a huge paradigm shift for me from what I was used to growing up. I mean, with in the in the culture that I grew up in, the Catholic faith, it was just very very different. Mm-hmm. And when I stepped away from the Catholic Church at the time, I felt very ostracized for you know when I went through my divorce, and I think a lot of it was my reflection internally of myself. I don't necessarily know that it was the church, but Coming to celebrate recovery, you know, you're talking about your issues openly and honestly, and out there, you're tra- you're being completely transparent, and that's not something that I was used to. That's mm-hmm. not something we did in the Catholic Church, right. and so yes, it was it was a very different way of doing things, and it took me some time to realize that people here were authentic and right. they were they weren't going to judge me. That was huge. Mm-hmm. The, the, the no judgment was just amazing. And that they truly, when they say they're going to come around you in love and acceptance, it, it's that is the absolute truth. Well, the biggest uh, hang up people have is making that first step. And that's what this right. show is all about, is making that first step and just realizing I got an issue, which you've done at this point in your story, and I need to do something. But that first time they walk into a, to a celebrate recovery or a meeting of some sort um, is the toughest one. How did you feel that first time you walked in? Interestingly enough, there, I had a friend who had told me, you know, uh, there was a woman there who shared the same history that I did with sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. And, and she was doing my newcomers 101 that night. <sighs> so I felt very comfortable sharing with her. And, and it's, you know, true story. She actually ended up becoming my sponsor, you know, <laughs> nice. a, a year later. Yeah. So I was nervous, but I, I was so ready, Darren, for that change and needing to, I just wanted to just be better. I wanted to feel better. I wanted to get better. So I was, you know, I was very excited about being there. I know Mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's the hardest part is walking through the door and coming in and sitting down. Well, the one thing about uh, making that decision and making that first step is it's like a ton of bricks lifted off your chest. I mean, you have hope all of a sudden, you know, now all of a sudden I'm not doing the same thing. Here we go. I'm going to do something different and there there's hope and look at all these other people right. that are in the same boat. Right. And, and, and in your case, you met a lady that was going through the same thing you were, which people yeah. discover all the time when right. they go to these, they, they think they're all alone. They think they're the worst. They think, you know, it's the same story over and over and over, but then they get Absolutely. there to, to a meeting and they realize that, well, here's 15 other people that are in the same boat. That so. have the same situation. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Anna, why don't you kind of tell us about Celebrate Recovery, what it's done for you. Did you, have you been through step studies? So after I had started attending uh, Celebrate Recovery for about six months, there was a step study starting, a women's step study. And uh, the women leaders there encouraged me to jump into that. Wasn't sure what to expect, but Mm -hmm. I said, sure, I'll do it. You know, being a codependent person and wanting people to like you, part of the step study is being very open and authentic and transparent with your answers. Right. You're you're sharing, you know, you're answering yeah. questions about your hurts, your habits, your mm-hmm. hangups, and you need to be very true. And and but the first couple of times I I was writing my answers to what I thought my group wanted to hear. 
Right. And then when I sat around the table and I heard these women sharing, like they were getting it, they were laying it all out there. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, if they're trusting me enough to share their life story, I need to do the same. And once I started being more authentic and transparent, I was scared, but it was the most freeing. Right. And it was just, a, I can't even explain it. What a, what a transformation that was that right. you have that acceptance and that love from these women. And mm-hmm. you're talking about things that are so painful to you. And they, all they, they look at you with love, like God loves you. And you know, the, the abuse wasn't your fault. And that was a huge, you know, that was a, a revelation that I, that I had never experienced because I carried this burden around with me mm. my entire adult life that somehow this was my fault. Learning that and knowing that God forgave me for my, all the mistakes I'd made, the yep. infidelities, all the things, and that I needed to forgive myself. That mm-hmm. was the hardest part was forgiving mm-hmm. myself. But once I did that, I was like, a, it was just a complete 180 when God started making that change in me and my heart. And, and I was a new person and I was behaving differently, um, just responding to people differently. I had healthy boundaries. I was able to say right. and, and do things that were more, that were true and honest. I was all in at that point. Yeah. And so I became a leader um, for our women's small group. And we have a, we have a, a small group for anger and abuse. Um, so I started helping co-lead that group. I also started leading, we started another step study for women the next year and I helped lead that step study Nice. and uh, have continued to lead a couple of other step studies. And my husband and I are now ministry leaders for the Celebrate Recovery, you know, here in the town where we live. Sounds like so, we missed a little piece there. The, uh, this is a new husband here. We didn't, didn't hear about <laughs> yes, yes. it. So, you better tell us <laughs> yes. about that. What happened? <laughs> So yes, um, just through getting healthy and yeah. and learning to love myself and found a true authentic man of Christ. Nice. As I tell my my call, I tell my girls, I want them to know, I want them to have a, I call him a smog, a sexy man of God. So yeah, <laughs> I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. Go. So told them to hold out for that. Hold out for that. So yeah, makes a difference. Uh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. He yeah we he also tended celebrate recovery and so we. We've uh, been married seven years, and Excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, go CR is going to be our church forever. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm glad things turned out that way. Then that's how these stories usually end up. Because well, that's uh, why we're talking to these folks. Exactly. They have new endings, right? That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's why we named the show that. Right? Uh, yeah. There you go. Okay. That was my bright idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can take credit for something. All right, uh, Anna. Thank you for coming on and being so honest with us. And I'm yeah, sure there's absolutely. a lot of people that are going to relate to your story. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, we really appreciate the time you took. With us. Thank, thank you both. Thank you so much. All right. For everyone else, uh-huh. for everyone else, we'll see you next week here on New Endings Radio.